like to present you with the gyroscopic transport of the future from Dahir in chat. So this got sent to me so many times on Twitter. The gyro bus, the way of the future, look how little road space it takes up. Thanks to the ramped up flywheel, a gyroscope keeps the same direction of the rotation access and effectively resists the effect of external moments of force. This means that as long as the flywheel maintains the necessary rotational speed, the car remains stable. Wow, that sounds really impressive as long as you don't want to go around corners. Our specialists at Dahir and Shet took inspiration from recent developments in the area of electric motor control and developed a gyro car that meets all current safety requirements. Roaring past you at race car speeds. Get out of the way. The bus of the future is here. In modern cities where the problem of traffic jams is of particular importance and it's physically and financially impossible to expand roads and build tunnels and ramps, the only solution is to utilize the unused road medium. On most routes, what was once called the shoulder lane will now be known as the busway, giving buses easy access to exits and on ramps. The main feature of our gyro car is its ability to fit into the existing road infrastructure while remaining independent from the rest of traffic. The design and reliability of our gyro train is such that it can be used both as passenger and freight transport. Plus, such a car can be used to create a real luxury mobile salon that stands no comparison, even with the most expensive limousines. Man, I'm starting to get a real strong Solar Roadways vibe off this thing. It'll do absolutely everything. Our gyro car can be used for emergency needs, such as a mobile operating room for performing urgent surgical operations. Yeah, it'll do absolutely everything, except ever be built in reality. Thanks to the use of modern materials and self-balancing mechanisms, the creation of such a car is already possible. Of course it is, which is why we're going for computer simulations rather than, say, for instance, oh, I know, functioning prototypes. If you like our concept and are ready to fund the creation of a sample unit, we will be happy to proceed and demonstrate the transport of the future to the whole world very shortly. Yeah, and this is what got sent to me so many times on Twitter. And look, they can go up and down so they can go under bridges like that. And this has to be the archetypal example of the uh, serial futurist inventor who i should note has the best part of a million subscribers who has had numerous inventions all of them proven by computer graphics you know just like this uh insta coffin we'd like to present the latest invention from dahir in chat the earthquake safety bed one of the main causes of death during an earthquake is the destruction of buildings especially if the earthquake happens while people are asleep in their beds for people living in seismically active regions, Dahir in chat has developed the Earthquake Safety Bed, which instantly transforms into a shelter during the first underground tremors of an earthquake. Let's see how it's made. <laughs> this allows the bed to maintain its shape beneath falling debris and protect its human occupant from harm. When the device activates, the mattress descends and the person is enclosed in a protected space. A lid automatically closes over the bed. The, ah! Help! the lid's closing equipment can function in various ways depending on the bed's size and design. The bed can also be equipped with vents to let air in. As long as there's no danger from smoke, these vents can be opened from the inside. Of course, if there does actually happen to be a fire outside, there's no way of cooling it down, so you'll just kind of be roasted alive inside this thing. And of course, if being buried in this box has covered up the vents, then it doesn't matter whether you open the vents or not, carbon dioxide can't get out and new air can't get in. Which means you will suffocate inside this thing in about 10 hours. Inside the bed are crucial items such as dry rations, water, hygienic bags, a first aid kit, a fire extinguisher, and a gas mask. Uh, no. <laughs> you use a fire extinguisher in a box this size, then letting all that carbon dioxide out into the box, all the particulates will certainly be fatal to you. Plus, how are you going to get to all that emergency stuff when there's a mattress between you and it? Really? How are you going to get to it? 
To make sure the bed can fit any home decor, Dahirin Schatz designers have envisioned dozens of decorative variations. What if the earthquake safety bed is your chance for survival? Provide for your safety ahead of time and sleep soundly. Yeah, in the good old days, it was just the artist's impression. But now we have graphics good enough to make a, a lot of people think that these are actual plans of something. Ironically, this trend was called out over a decade ago, of all people, by the onion. President Obama announced changes to his proposed recovery act today, replacing his national high-speed rail plan with a national high-speed bus plan. With the uh, hyper bus. Crews at speeds of up to 165 miles per hour will save more than $17 billion from the country's recovery budget. Yes, and the uh, hyper bus here is a remarkably similar proposal to one of Elon Musk's great inventions, but I can't quite remember which one. Buses can be retrofitted and modernized for as little as $40. Starting January 1st, you'll be sharing the road with the next generation of buses roaring past you at race car speeds. Thanks to the small bearing section and light composite bodies. Get out of the way, the bus of the future is here. Such a car can quickly move down a special fortified strip between lanes and over the rest of traffic. On most routes, what was once called the shoulder lane will now be known as the busway, giving buses easy access to exits and on-ramps. You know, where you just warp physics in the animations. Highways without shoulders will be rechristened shared multi-vehicle routes. Creating almost no interference for other vehicles. Christened shared multi-vehicle routes and will support new signs to keep drivers alert to buses. And of course, this is all done tongue-in-cheek for fun and all that sort of thing so people can see how absurd it is. The high-speed bus plan is just the latest initiative aimed at improving America's infrastructure. But what if you took out the crazy lane changes and said it was the brainchild of a visionary billionaire? Evacuated tube transport uses airless vacuum tubes, which move faster and use less energy to travel between destinations. Six-person capsules travel in the tubes on frictionless maglev tracks and can reach a maximum speed of 6,500 kilometers per hour. And put it in, say, for instance, a tube and call it the Hyperloop. And that's exactly what came to pass two years after The Onion put out their uh, Hyperbus story. All from New York to L.A. in 45 minutes and from New York to China in just two hours. Oh, yeah. And by the way, it goes without saying that Everyone on that capsule got killed by the acceleration of the launch. It's going to happen. Stop. 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 Anyway, the gyro bus. Where to start? Firstly, like the Hyperloop, it's not even remotely a new idea. The idea of gyro stabilized vehicles like this has been around for at least 100 years. And they always run into the same set of problems. I mean, gyroscopes for inertial guidance, they've been functional for a long time. These gyroscopes are the brains of the rocket. They are in universal mountings. Electrical pickups measure the movements of the gyroscope and translate these movements to the carbon vanes and the trimmers in the tail unit. Yet those are just inertial frame references for guiding the rocket. Using the actual gyroscopes to stabilize the vehicle, that in a different league altogether. I mean, some of the first things they tried to do like this was gyroscopic stabilization on ships. And you'll notice something about when they were trying to do this, it was in the, uh, you know, it's like uh, in 1917 or 1932 with 100 ton flywheels before being replaced with a fin stabilization due to its much lower weight and cost. Now the history of anti-roll gyroscopes in cars is similar. The first attempts were in the 1900s, and then again it was revisited in the 1950s, where as a publicity stunt, Ford released the uh, Ford Gyron, with lots of artists' impressions and uh, models. And there was another company that actually built a working prototype. Well, the car was developed in 1966 and 1967 by two very famous people, Tom Summers and Alex Tremulus which has recently been refurbished and eh, kinda works. Unfortunately, the Gyro X was deemed unstable, a result of its complex engineering that was still years away from being perfected. I would say we've gotten it to work as well as it probably ever did, so we've decided that we're not gonna drive it on public roads, and we're gonna drive it like at shows, uh, maybe in the areas where there's not other traffic and things like that. Basically, the whole thing went nowhere. 
it seemed that people kind of worked out that putting things on four wheels made them much more stable and it was a much cheaper solution. Well, that was until about 10 years ago when the LIT came out. The concept behind LIT Motors C1 is simple. Why haul around 4,000 pounds of car? We can ride a self-stabilizing two-wheeler that marries all the creature comforts of a car with the performance and efficiencies of a motorcycle. The company says it will even stay upright in the event of a collision. So the C1, uh, it takes the romance and the efficiency of a motorcycle and we integrate that with the safety and the comfort of a car. So it's a two-wheeled, um, self-balancing motorcycle. Who were, of course, another one of these kind of change the world with the electric vehicles type thing. The vehicle is fully electric and enclosed. Its top speed will be 120 miles an hour. But what makes it truly unique is its ability to balance on two inline wheels, even when stopped. Program the vehicle to do a trek like a stoppy or to drift into a parallel parking space. There's a lot of creative turns that uh, anyone uh, could uh, actually execute. <laughs> So you wouldn't have to spend 1,000 hours on a motorcycle uh, as a stunt rider uh, to learn how to drift your motorcycle. You could just buy the program for it. So basically there's an app for drifting. Yeah. I'm balanced, right? Which came out in about 2011 and was never heard of again after 2012. The story of gyro stabilized trains is similar. Lots of interest in the early 1900s, followed by a hundred years of never speaking of it again. Look, gyroscopes are weird things, and it really matters which direction they're spinning in and which direction you're putting force on on the axis that it's rotating on. And yes, I did make all of my gyros in this case spinning flat earths. It seemed kind of apt. But probably the easiest way to pick up how these gyros behave is from watching battle bots, because the spinning robots, eh, they do some weird stuff. So in the first instance, we'll take Nightmare, because it's fairly obvious which way the spinny thing works, until, of course, you yeah, want to try and turn this thing. Nightmare seems to be off balance there at the turn. Yeah, that's the gyroscopic uh, stabilization working against you. As uh, so you try and spin this thing, you get this thing called precession, which practically manifests itself by when you apply a force in one direction to the axis, it basically goes in 90 degrees to the way you expect it to. And that's the precession that you're looking at there. So if you were to get this bus and try and get it to turn around a corner, all that's going to happen is it'll roll straight over to one side like this. So yeah, I can't stabilize it with the disc spinning this way. If the disc is spinning this way, of course, well, then it's actually on the axis that the vehicle is traveling on, and there would be no stabilization for the vehicle here whatsoever. It would just fall over. So it can't be that one, which means that this is probably the only one that you've got left that is sensible. So let's go back to BattleBots for this. Now, one of the reasons that spinning in this direction is so favored in things like BattleBots is that it makes the vehicle exceptionally hard to flip. And it can rotate on the axis it's spinning on with no problem. So why don't we just use that in our um, donut cars? Well, that would be great if you were low to the ground like a car and were happy to uh, stop every time you wanted to change directions. But most people know that when you go around a corner, hmm, quickly, you feel a force pushing you outwards. Ironically, of course, you are accelerating towards the middle, which does actually mean the force is towards the middle, but we'll stick with its felt pushing you outwards for this example. Now, stick your car on a massive set of stilts to add lots of leverage to this. Basically put the uh, centripetal force you're feeling on steroids. Now you've got a real problem because when you go around the corner, you've got this huge force pushing outwards, essentially trying to rotate the gyroscope this way. And all of that, thanks to the uh, gyroscopic stabilization, will basically be translated into a force on this axis. Basically, whenever this thing goes around a corner, it will have a tendency to derail and flip. And this is before we get on to the obviously stupid stuff like, what, really? The whole vehicle weight is taken on two skinny tires like that. Yeah, I don't think those things will last long. And why exactly does it deploy airbags when there's 
no obvious reason for it to do it? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to deploy airbags on the, uh, the stalk that holds the vehicle up or something? Or what does the gyro bus do when it's got to go under a bridge, but it's solid cars below it? Likewise, it's great that the gyro bus can breeze past car crashes, but what if that car crash has actually been into the central reservation? What then? Similarly, they won't be able to go up or downhill without having a tendency to derail. That's how gyroscopes work. A solution to LA traffic? You can split lanes in this thing. The main feature of our gyro car is its ability to fit into the existing road infrastructure while remaining independent from the rest of traffic. The duo believed that the Gyro X could solve many of the issues presented by cars at the time. Also, it would be half the width of a normal car at that time, and so you could put twice as many cars on the existing roads. In modern cities, where the problem of traffic jams is of particular importance, and it's physically and financially impossible to expand roads and build tunnels and ramps. And so you could put twice as many cars on the existing roads. So if it's starting to go in this direction, shift your weight to your left. Not a lot, just a little. Back to the right. Similarly, most of the other gyroscopic vehicles had some sort of dynamic element of the gyroscope to steer the vehicle. The gyroscopes have classically been pretty heavy. I mean, it was about 20 tons in the case of the ship and 120 kilos in the case of the car. Flywheel, it weighs about 230 pounds. It spins inside of this sphere. And that was just for the gyroscope on a half car. There's also a crazy amount of energy in these spinning objects. I mean, yeah, if you look back over Robot Wars, the spinners have classically been the most deadly for the obvious reason that, yeah, can keep putting energy into the spinny thing. And having something spinning that fast between your legs. This right here is a gyroscope. This is the key to making the vehicle work. It allows it to be stabilized and balanced and go forward on two wheels. Uh, no, thank you. Let alone of the nightmare situation of one of these gyroscopes actually detaching and becoming loose. Now, in my entire life, there's only ever been about three instances where I looked at one of these futuristic -y animations, and in the reality that came to pass, it looked credibly like what was in the animations. That's three out of hundreds, and all of them involved NASA and Mars. The first was the Spirit and Opportunity landing. Ooh, gyroscopic stabilization. Isn't that cute? Which were doubled up because of the high risks that not even NASA was so sure they could pull this off. After six months in space, the first thing that you have to do is hit this incredibly narrow atmospheric window and lose some speed. Then you deploy a parachute and lose the heat shield, descend on a rope, inflate some airbags, fire the retros at exactly the right altitude in a second specific window, then bounce around for a bit, deflate the airbags, maybe right the tetrahedron, and then have the rover unpack itself, sufficiently unbumped by all of the knocks that it's had, that it actually rolls off the platform in a functioning form. And if any of that goes wrong, Mars just gets itself a new crater. And the generation after that was the sky crane. So first of all, you've got to get the launch right and all that thing. And then, then the probe's got to whoosh past you because even in NASA animations, things go whoosh in space. So then it's got to be woken up after some nine months in space and successfully attached. Then of course, you've got to hit the very narrow re-entry window and you've got to deploy a parachute at ludicrous speed, drop the heat shield, then drop the rover, which then has to stabilize itself on monopropellant thrusters, uh, rappel down some lines from the sky crane, detach all of those lines at the exact right moment, get the sky crane clear, and if all of that goes well, yeah, get yourself a new rover on Mars. Then there was the Mars helicopter, which I actually ran the numbers on and came to the exact conclusions that NASA did, that this was a high-risk, high-reward project. I mean, sure, I call out the bullshit about the stunt flight because that was utter bullshit. But the numbers checked out fine. It's just that it was clearly high-risk stuff. But ultimately, it did what it was meant to do. You know, first of all, just fly on Mars and then provide some reconnaissance. And it's been a remarkable success. Now, the Mars helicopter is actually fascinating for another reason. You see, I bust a lot of bullshit on the internet, and a lot of people 
really don't like that when I do it to probably the biggest purveyor of computer generated bullshit on the planet, Elon Musk. And if you're thinking I'm going to go off on Elon Musk, well, kinda, but trust me, this one wraps up beautifully at the end. You see, Musk's legacy with the computer generated graphics goes back at least a decade. Just look at this computer generated animation of the Falcon 9, all working perfectly, which was going to be fully and rapidly reusable and drop the launch cost by over 90%. In reality, over 10 years later, they have gone from a fully rapidly reusable rocket to being a fully reusable rocket to a partially reusable rocket then just basically a reusable booster something that the space shuttle had been doing for decades it wasn't rapid it didn't save that much money and really if someone can tell me what's going on with the back end of this second stage i would love to know i mean what does it really have a retractable rocket engine like why and this was a big problem for the elon musk fans who didn't want to know any of that because they wanted to believe the new promises that the big version of the Falcon 9 was also going to be fully rapidly reusable. Just like Elon said. With Starship, we're aiming for full and rapid reusability. Yeah, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee. This says, fool me once. Shame on, shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. After all, Elon Musk himself said that SpaceX risked bankruptcy. We need all hands on deck to recover from what is, quite frankly, a disaster. What it comes down to is that we face a genuine risk of bankruptcy if we can't achieve a Starship flight rate of at least once every two weeks next year. Thanks, Elon. Starship, we're aiming for full and rapid reusability. So, uh, you know, we obviously need to accomplish that. That's not uh, <laughs> done yet. But, um, but, but the success is one of the possible outcomes. Yeah. Not necessarily. There's definitely a very slim chance we'll survive. And we're now halfway through 2022, and there is no sign of a launch of Starship, which means they've now got about six months left to get to a launch rate of two per month. At which point you just look at it and say, yeah, they're going bankrupt. Pretty much the Musk fans hate me with the incandescent rage of a thousand blue stars. If only there was some easy button they could push that would simply discredit everything that I ever said. And then it's like, I know, you made a video about the Mars helicopter, so he must have said it wasn't possible. Ha! Gotcha! He's been totally discredited, and now Musk's bullshit animations are safe for another day. And it wasn't just one or two who flocked to my Mars helicopter video. It was hundreds, sufficiently delusional that clearly none of them had watched the actual video, which literally states that the video agrees with NASA's assessment that it's high risk, high reward. But they made damn sure to leave a comment on a video they hadn't watched saying how this discredited me. It's hard to overstate how cultish this is. It'd be like leaving a comment on my solar roadways, hyperloop or free water from air videos saying that, ha, Thunderfoot's lost all credibility by praising the solar roadways, hyperloop and free water from air devices. This is what I would call the cult of Musk. Meanwhile, in reality, Musk's attempt to build the uh, Hyperloop as a working product have been far less successful than the 100-year-old attempt to build a gyro car. And this is one of the reasons why I rant about Musk a lot, because the simple reality is Elon Musk is the biggest pusher of this visionary pseudoscience on the planet. The only real difference between Musk and a gazillion other delusional computer-generated graphics wannabes is he made a lot of money because he was fired for incompetence by a company that, without any of his input, became the extremely valuable PayPal and made him a boatload of money because even after he was fired for incompetence, he still kept his shares. That makes you rich, not smart. The animations here are about as convincing 
as a computer-generated graphic space company or a computer-generated population of Mars. His animations about tunnel travel were weapons-grade balloonium, and it still became a multi-billion dollar company. His animations about the reusable Falcon 9 a decade ago have now been replaced with animations of a fully reusable starship. And just to bring the whole thing into a perfect full circle, who chimes in with a brilliant new idea how to catch Starship boosters? Oh, the Instamental Coffin Guy. You know, the donut bicycle inventor. To which all of the Elon Musk fans who cannot distinguish between fancy graphics and reality simply go... <laughs> Fake it till you make it. You know, run by people who don't actually know how to make things. is simply called faking it. And if your company is not selling products, but burning investor money, in the fashion of companies that have bought in billions of dollars of investment, but where their biggest contract only cost $50 million, and you bought in all of that investment because you told them you could actually make a product, that's called a Ponzi scheme. And it works fine until you run out of capital. What it comes down to is that we face a genuine risk of bankruptcy if we can't achieve a Starship flight rate of at least once every two weeks next year. Thanks, Elon. I mean, seriously, am I the only one who takes a look at the gyro bus video and sees exactly the same digital fantasy of Elon Musk's tunnels video? That both of these things are utterly delusional. Anyway, that's today's video. If you enjoyed it, drop a thumbs up on it. Subscribe if you don't want to miss out on more great content like this. And as ever, if you really enjoyed the work of this channel, you can support it directly on Patreon and Earth. Thanks for watching.